If you haven't already, turn in your Bibles to Jonah. We'll be looking at actually Jonah 1 and Jonah 2 today. Everyone has heard the term collateral damage, right? We've heard this term and we know kind of, even if you don't know exactly what the definition is, you understand what it is. But it means other damage inflicted that is, incident, that is an incidental result of an activity. Of an activity or maybe a non-activity. Maybe someone doesn't do something, right? And there could be collateral damage. Well, with Jonah, we know his heart, right? His heart is to not go to Nineveh. His heart is to go the other way and to not go to Nineveh and proclaim, listen, change your ways or God is going to kill you. You're going to be destroyed. Well, because of his disobedience, of course, there could be possible collateral damage if they don't get this message. Now, of course, we know the rest of the story and we'll be looking at that more next week. But we also see collateral damage here, right? In this particular event, of Jonah's life, when he's in the ship and we see the storm, right? A storm that these sailors have maybe, maybe never seen before. Not this furious, not waves this big. And so they're freaked out, they're scared to death, and they're trying to figure out what do we do? And of course, sailors know that if you're in big waves like that, what you need to do is just start, start throwing things overboard, right? Get as much of the boat out of the water as you can. Make it as light as possible. And so they start throwing things overboard. What all did they throw overboard? Well, we don't have an itemized list, right? But we can start to guess. We can start to think, well, maybe the food that they had, all of the food that they had stored up for their voyages, maybe if they were on their way somewhere with some, some merchandise to sell, or maybe they're on their way back, right? They've purchased things and they're on their way back. And we don't know exactly what it was, but we know one thing, that everything they had that wasn't bolted down, they were trying to throw overboard so that they would survive what they were currently in when God sent a wind, a tempest, a really bad storm. So they go, they start to pray, and they're trying to figure out, where, where's that guy, that Noah guy? Where is he? He needs to be praying as well. So they go down, and they find him. What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Why aren't you praying? Because as you can imagine, the sailors in the midst of this kind of storm are all praying, right? They're all praying to their gods. Now, may, maybe some of them have the same God that they're praying to. Maybe some of them have multiple gods that they're praying to, covering all of their bases. They say, listen, we're praying. You need to be praying as well. But we notice that one thing that Jonah isn't doing, he isn't praying, is he? In the midst of this storm, he's not praying. And we can guess why he's not praying, right? He didn't want to purposely go into the presence of God because he knew what God would say. Ever been in a situation like that? Where you know that what you're doing, you're not supposed to be doing, or you're not doing what you should be doing. And maybe your prayer life drops off a little bit during that time because it's kind of uncomfortable to go before God knowing what you know. I think that's what we find here with Jonah He's not going into the prayer closet very often. So they decide to cast lots, right? Nothing is working. Prayers are going up. The sea is still as crazy and as tumultuous as ever. And so they decide to cast lots, and the lot falls to Jonah. And then, of course, they ask, who are you? Where are you from? What is it about you that's making this happen? And then here we have the first theological statement of the book. I am a Hebrew, and I fear or worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the land. So here we have really a confession. And in this confession, Jonah condemns himself, doesn't he? Because he has just told them, this is who God is. I know this about God. Yet he still chooses to disobey He's still choosing to rebel against this God, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. And in this moment, God is displaying his sovereignty over all of creation, isn't he? The Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, 
And there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. And during this, Jonah evidently told the men that he was fleeing from the Almighty God and to throw him overboard. It's interesting. He doesn't say, you know what, I know what's going on here. Yes, I'm rebelling. I'm fleeing. Let me just pray. Let me pray and everything's going to be okay. That's not what he says here. Throw me overboard. How much must you hate a people group to want to die instead of going to them and proclaiming repentance, proclaiming that they need to repent, proclaiming that they are about to be destroyed if they do not change their ways, turn from their evil ways? How much must you hate a group to be willing to die instead of going to them? Well, that's what we have here, right? Willing to die instead of do what God had called him to do. He was willing to die instead of going to to a people he hated and preaching repentance. In our rebellion, in our bitterness, in our forgiveness, in our unwillingness to submit our hearts and minds to God's ways, there's always collateral damage, right? So we see the collateral damage here with Jonah and the sailors and possible collateral damage if he doesn't go to the Ninevites. But it's true for all of us, isn't it? If we don't do what God is calling us to do, we think it just affects me, right? And it doesn't. There's always, always people around us that it impacts. Possibly people on the other side of the world that it impacts as well. There's always collateral damage when we say no to God. These men, because of his rebelliousness, are in real peril. They have already thrown all of their goods overboard, right? And now here's Jonah saying, throw me overboard and everything will calm down and you'll be saved. And look at what they do. These pagan sailors who Jonah probably did not have very high regard for them either. And look what these pagan sailors do. They row even harder. No, we're not going to throw you overboard. We're not going to let you die. But they finally realize that there's just no use. That this God of Jonah's is not going to let them reach safety. And they're battling against a powerful God and they know it. And so they relent, right? Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. So here's the first point that I want you to remember, first of two points. First one is this, stay awestruck by God's great power. Even here, God uses a reluctant prophet to draw pagan sailors into a relationship of worship. They have an understanding now that there is one true God who is worthy of their praises, who's worthy of their sacrifices, who's worthy of their vows. How long? How long were they in awe of this God? For some, maybe a lifetime. For others, probably over before they pulled into the next harbor. But it's really important for us to understand this about foxhole conversions happen, right? And when you're in the middle of it, God save me. If you'll save me, if you will calm these waters down, if you will fix this situation, I will serve you. I will do whatever you ask me to do. You notice that they don't say that. Prior to, it's after everything calms down and they realize, wow, that God of the guy that we just threw overboard, he's real. He's powerful. That's when we see them making vows. That's when we see them making sacrifices. It's really important to understand 
that the sailors use the covenant name Yahweh when they're talking about God. They could have used Elohim, and they actually do a little bit later. But here they're using the term Yahweh, the Hebrew personal name that denotes a personal saving relationship with him. <coughs> Excuse me. Psalm 111 and Proverbs 9 tells us that the fear of the Lord is the essence of all saving knowledge and wisdom. Can someone give me a cup of water? This, this isn't going away. <coughs> Thank you. <clears throat> And the sailors immediately begin to offer oaths and sacrifices to the Lord. Whereas before they thought of him as... I'll be okay. It's really weird. Whereas before, they just thought of him as, as Jonah's tribal deity, right? Just one of many just like the ones that they had, just one of many. But now he has delivered them. And he helps them to see, this helps them to see the greatness of who God really is. Thank you so much, David. It could be used to terrify. (laughs) (laughs) Hmm. So they take the time to show the proper respect and worship that God deserves. The God who created the sea and the land, the one true God, they now know who he is. So God's power was fully on display with these sailors and now a new group of worshipers is formed. I I oftentimes in our youth group with the young men, also in our our Bass Bro, Basilean Brotherhood, a group of two groups of men that I meet with, I oftentimes encourage them to be looking around, to be looking around what's happening in their life. What's happening in their life? What is God teaching you this week through the word? What, what is God impressing upon you this week? How's he changing you? What are you seeing happening in other people's lives, the lives of those around you? And the reason I do that is because I know myself for one thing, that if I'm not intentional about looking around, if I'm not intentional about some reflection, self-reflection, God, what are you teaching me in this, that, that type of thing, then I'm oblivious to it, right? That's just, that's just the reality of me, and it's the reality of most men, unfortunately, right? We just kind of, let's go, let's, let's do this thing. And we're not looking around saying, God, what are you doing? What are you doing in me? What are you doing in my friends? How, how are you working mightily and powerfully in people's lives? And so I encourage them, guys, every week, what did you see this week? What did you see? And we're starting to get better. We're starting to get a little better about being a little more observant about what God is teaching us and about what we're seeing in the lives of the people around us as well. To not be oblivious. Because when we're not oblivious, when we are actually paying attention and we're seeing God do these things... Maybe it's little things. All of a sudden, we start to see that that desire that I had is starting to lessen. This desire that I shouldn't have, this desire that doesn't bring glory to God, is starting to lessen a little bit. And my affections are starting to be placed on Jesus a little bit more, right? Or we, we hear a story about someone whose eye was miraculously healed or any number of things, right? We start to worship God even more. We start to praise him. Why? Because we're not being oblivious. God is at work all the time, brothers and sisters. He is working all the time. We just need to slow down and pay attention. And the more we do that, I think we truly will be awestruck at the glory of our God, of his goodness, of his grace, of his mercy, that he is continually pouring forth showering us with. And so that's my encouragement to you to be looking this week, looking for ways that God is working, looking for ways that, that, that you could see his power and just be awestruck by his love and grace. And as you are, you'll become, as you become more aware, the more you will praise him. The more you will praise him. When Jesus is on the cross, Psalm, he quotes Psalm 22, 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
And if you go just a couple of verses below that, it's really interesting what Scripture says. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you, your fathers trusted, they trusted and you delivered them. To you, they cried and were rescued. Did you notice what it says in the middle of that? Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. I love that word picture. God is lifted up and magnified when his people praise him. When we stay in awe, awestruck of God's power and goodness, and most importantly, his grace. Don't you love that word picture? That as we praise him more and more, God is enthroned in the praises of his people. That's a beautiful word picture, and we are his people. And we are called to be a people that praise him. J.I. Packer said, many people sing Amazing Grace, right? We love that song. It's a wonderful, wonderful song. And oftentimes give give lip service to the idea. But he says that, that grace has not profoundly changed them. He said, God's grace becomes wondrously, endlessly consoling, beautiful, and humbling only when we fully believe, grasp, and remind ourselves of the gospel. And let me just break down three gospel truths this morning for us so we just take these to heart so we remember these. Because as we remember these more and more, again, it'll draw us into worship. It'll draw us into a place of praise. The first one is this. That we deserve nothing but condemnation. That just puts you in a place of worship right there, doesn't it? We deserve nothing but condemnation. Number two, that we are utterly incapable of saving ourselves. But then number three, that God has saved us. Despite our sin at infinite cost to himself. Brothers and sisters, when you put those three together, that is reason to worship. We deserve nothing but condemnation. We are utterly incapable of saving ourselves. And that God has saved us despite our sin at an infinite cost to himself. I love what Tim Keller says when he says, some people have too high a view of themselves. God's grace is not stunning because they don't feel it, feel that they need it, or at least not so much. Others do indeed see themselves as failures, but while they may have some notion of an abstract God of love, they have little idea of the enormity of Jesus' sacrifice to purchase them out of debt, slavery, and death. They aren't lost in wonder, love, and praise at the lengths and depths at which he has gone for us. Brothers and sisters, may this not be true of us. May we sing amazing grace with all the fervor of people who never tire, standing awestruck of God's great grace and mercy. Let's sing that next week. Can we do that? Okay. So the rebellious prophet is sent to Nineveh. A ruthless pagan pagan city that worshipped a lot of gods, but the primary one was Dagon, right? So Jonah has been called to go to Nineveh. We know that he's rebelling. We know that he's being cast out of the ship. But but who are the Ninevites? Rather, rather who do they worship? And and I want us to get a get a handle on this because they did. They worshipped a lot of gods, but the primary one was Dagon. And Dagon is the same God that, small g, that the Philistines worshipped. Do you remember the story yeah. of 1 Samuel? Yeah, 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 yeah. So they have, they have taken the, the Ark of the Covenant, right? They've taken it from the Israelites, and, and now they ta- they've taken it back to Ashdod. And they placed the Ark in the same temple as the statue of Dagon. 
The next day, they go into this house of worship, right? And what do they find? They find Dagon face down. He's fallen face down. So they, you know, they put Dagon back up. Well, that was weird, right? So the next day, they come in, and what do they find? They found Dagon again down, but his head is over here. Both of his uh, hands have been broken off, and just his torso is intact. And so they start to think, okay, there's something happening here, right? Well, it takes them seven months to figure it out. I mean, it takes them seven months to figure out they cannot go against this God, the God of the Ark and of the Covenant, right? God sends boils. He sends all of these different things, and they know this is the God of Israel, So after seven months, they finally send the Ark of the Covenant back. And of course, the things stop. All the afflictions stop at that point. So this is is Dagon. The same God of the Philistines is is the God of the Ninevites. And these gods, right? You think about Roman gods and Greek gods. They were all gods of something. So when you think about Greek gods, you think about Demeter, who's the goddess of agriculture and harvest. You think of Ares, the god of war. Apollo, the god of music, art, knowledge, and a lot of other things I was surprised to see. Dagon, the god of the Philistines and the god of the Ninevites, is the god of fish. Did you know that? The god of fish. And you got to love God's sense of irony. In Jonah 1.17, when we read, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. A lot of thoughts go through one's mind when you have three days of solitude, right? Now, three days of solitude in a cabin in the wilderness is ideal, But God knew what Jonah needed. Three days in the belly of a fish. I love what Peter Craigie says. He writes that when we reject and disobey God, as Jonah did, it takes treatment if it is to be remedied. He points out, That the text has been depicting Jonah as descending, going down to Joppa, down into a ship, down into the depths of the ship. And now finally, he goes even further down into the very depths of the ocean. And then he says this, but not until he was all the way down, finally stripped of his buoyant self-sufficiency, was deliverance possible. If Jonah was going to begin to finally ascend, both in the water and in faith, he had to be brought to the very end of himself. The way up, first of all, was down. The usual place to learn the greatest secrets of God's grace is usually at the bottom. That's that's amen worthy, isn't it? Because every single one of us know that to be true. The usual place to learn the greatest secrets of God's grace is usually at the bottom. And it's in this place, physically and spiritually, that Jonah turns back to God. Jonah 2, 1. I'm just going to read all of Jonah 2. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol Sheol, I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. A little parenthetical, God didn't really drive him away, right? Jonah chose to run, but this is Jonah. And what we know about Jonah is he's always trying to find an angle. Yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life and deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit. O oh Lord, my God, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. 
Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. Again, this is Jonah. He's got a little, get a little jab at the Ninevites there. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. That's just a summary statement of the entire Bible right there, isn't it? Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Ever prayed this kind of prayer? Prayer of absolute desperation, but a prayer of absolute earnestness. A prayer of absolute praise because you've caught a glimpse of God's grace in your life. The weight of what he has done is weighing heavy upon him, but the glory of his God breaks through. His power, his willingness to save, his mercy toward a person who so willingly rebels against God's calling. Yet God is still merciful. With 2020 hindsight, this is, this is true, isn't it? With 2020 hindsight, we can see that most of the lessons that we have learned in life are the results, are the result rather, of God's severe mercies. Would you agree with that? They are events that were difficult or even excruciating at the time, but later, but later came to yield more good in our lives than we could have ever foreseen when we were in the middle of it. Again, every single one of us in here, if we have any years on our lives, probably say amen to that. And this is the core of God's grace, isn't it? Jonah has just caught a glimpse of this. That no matter how down we are, no matter how far away we may run, no matter how far we think we are from God, he's right there. He's right there and he's ready to draw us back. And in the midst of whatever we are in, he is going to teach us things about his character, about who we are. So we have a clear understanding and clear vision of who we really are. And when we really understand who we really are and we start to understand more fully who God really is, again, reason to praise, reason to worship. And here's the second point. Prayer is primary for integrity. What? You may be asking. Well, you'll see. If we get serious about prayer from the beginning, it allows us to not pray in crisis mode only, right? To be proactive instead of reactive in our prayer life. We have all done this, though. We have all acted without praying and then find ourselves in fervent prayer when we find ourselves in the middle of a pickle, right? Prayer comes really fast and furious at that point. It becomes a lot easier. But without a life of prayer, hear me, without a life of prayer, and, and, and I'm not talking about just throwing up an occasional prayer and that type of thing, you know, a quick two-minute prayer here or there. I'm talking about a life of prayer that understands that we need to go to God with everything, the little and the, the, the small and the big, everything. Without a life of prayer, there is no way to stay aligned with the heart and mind of God. That's just the reality. Because left to our own devices, without going to God, we just start to, 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 to veer off track, don't we? We start to really pursue the things that, that we want to pursue, our own agenda, all of those types of things, without a life of prayer that keeps us in line with God's heart and mind. Without prayer, we will focus on our own story and the narrative that, that we want to write and not the story that God would have us to live. Again, our own plans, desires, agendas end up oftentimes moving us in a direction that God has not called us to. Now, it's not necessarily outright rebellion when this happens, right? Not like Jonah, who knows what he should be doing, but yet chooses, says, no, I'm not doing that. I'm going here instead. Goes in the opposite direction. He knew exactly what, we, what he was doing. Our moving in the opposite direction often happens because of lack of asking God 
what would you have me to do in this? God, this is what I'm thinking. Is, is this right? Is this the direction I should go? Or just not thinking about it at all, right? Doing our own thing just comes naturally. And asking for direction from God, if we never do it, if we never go to him, just seems so unnatural. And the longer we go without doing it, the more unnatural it feels. And the harder it is to get back into this life of prayer. Dr. Henry Cloud says this. He defines the word integrity this way. It is the courage to meet the demands of reality. I like this definition. The courage to meet the demands of reality. If ultimate reality is bound up in God, which it is, he not only created all things, but he sustains all things. He directs the affairs of men. Ultimate reality then integrity or wholeness, a Christ-integrated wholeness, life begins then to get serious about the way that we should live our lives. So integrity, we oftentimes think of integrity as honesty, don't we? That's a, that's a man of integrity, a woman of integrity, and we automatically in our minds think that means that they are honest. But in reality, a more fully orbed understanding of integrity is, is wholeness, right? Again, matching up with reality. And so when we say that we desire to be people of integrity, what we are saying is that we desire for our lives to align with reality as much as possible. And so that's what we're talking about here. Again, if ultimate reality is bound up in God, then we need to start aligning our thoughts, aligning our lives more in thinking with his thinking. Because the more we do that, the more of a life of integrity we can live. I know if this were to happen, what I'm about to say, then the book of Job maybe wouldn't even be in the Bible. Or maybe it would, but it would be even shorter than it currently is. But can you imagine if when Job was called to go to Nineveh, he had this kind of reaction instead. Lord, I know what you're calling me to. I can't hide my heart from you, but, but no, you know how I feel about these people, and I, I don't want you to save them. I want you to smite the Ninevites, okay? That's just truth. I want them to be judged and destroyed. But you've called me to go to them. And you've called me to call them to repentance. And I know you call me to do that because you're a God of love and you desire for them to repent. So what I'm going to ask you to do is to change my heart. Because my heart is not at all in alignment with what you're calling me to do. So change my heart. Align my thinking and my heart with yours. Now that's not what happened. But I think one of the reasons it didn't happen is because God knows what really did happen is much more akin to how we react oftentimes. Oftentimes our reaction when we are called to do something that we don't want to do isn't instantly, okay God, you know my heart. I'm an open book to you. I need you to change my heart. I need you to do such a, a renovation of my heart that I will gladly do this. That's typically not the response. Typically the response is, how do I get out of this? I'm just not hearing God right, right? I just, that's it. I'm not hearing God right. The story of Jonah and his obstinance is much closer to how many of us live our lives. That's just the reality. We justify what we want to do. We go forward with our own plans and then turn to God when our plans turn into a crisis. But prayer allows us to keep our perspective, doesn't it? I, I've told you guys these, these types of stories before that living in Colorado, we would go hiking a lot and some of the hikes are just really, really difficult. Some of them, I mean, literally, you are just, all you can do is just one foot in front of the other and just look at the few feet in front of you, and that's it. That's all you can do. Sometimes mile after mile after mile. 
But if you just always look down, guess what? You can get into a lot of trouble, right? But I remember on the women, in the Womenuch Wilderness, we were on this hike, and this was a 28-mile hike, and we are above tree line a lot, and tree line's 12,000 feet and higher, and we we're up above tree line a lot, and I was in that situation where there were two other guys, and this is all we could do, just one foot in front of the other. And I remember one time just saying, okay, I've got to stop. I just got to stop. And I raised my head and it was one of the most glorious views I have ever seen in my life of the Chicago basin down below us. It was absolutely gorgeous. I don't know how long I had been walking like this and been missing all of this. But we do that in our own lives, don't we? We kind of get so focused on our stories, on what my life is about what I want out of life. And we're kind of looking like this. And God just says, raise your, raise your eyes. Raise your eyes. Let me show you what I'm doing. Let me show you where I want you to be participating. Let me show you what I want you to be doing with your life. And it's so much better than this right here. Prayer allows us to raise our eyes and to gain God's perspective. So maybe you're in one of these places where you just feel like you're, it's kind of been about you for a long time. And, and sometimes I understand, I get it, it's hard, life can be difficult, hard situations. And maybe... You're in a situation where you know you should be doing something and you're not or you shouldn't be doing something and you are and you haven't gone to the Lord in prayer in a long time. So circumstances, situations just kind of drive us away from going to God in prayer in the way that we should. But let me just encourage you, whether you're the one that's kind of been focused just on yourself or maybe you're one that's kind of been running a little bit and don't want to go to God because you're afraid of what he'll say. Let me just say, I encourage you to go to the Lord in prayer. Go with a heart and mind open to him, setting the direction that he needs to set for your life so that you can gain perspective once again. Allow him to take your eyes off the immediate situation and give you that larger perspective. And I know for some of you, maybe it's, maybe it's scary to think about that. But you will not regret it. Again, a life of integrity is, is having the courage to face reality. And the reality that we want to be able to face, that we want to engage in, is God's reality. His plans for the world. His plans for your life. His plans for those around you that you love. So let's have the courage to face reality. But we don't do it alone. We do it by the power of His Spirit giving us the strength to do what he's called us to do, giving us an openness of eyes and heart to do what he's called us to do and to be changed to be able to do it, right? Jonah didn't pray because he knew he wasn't going to like what God said, so he refused to go to God because he wanted to carry his own plan, his own agenda. Only when he found himself as low as he could go did he turn back to God. Again, why did Jonah not go to God? Well, obstinance, fear, anger, hate, all of the above. Yes, I think so. Hate for the Ninevites, anger that God would even ask him to do this, all of those types of things. So we need to examine ourselves, don't we? Why are we holding back from praying? What are we holding back in prayer because we're afraid of how God will respond? Afraid of what he'll tell us to do or not to do. Or, you know what you're supposed to do. And if you pray, he will just impress it upon you even more and you don't want that. What are your reasons? Has he been calling and you have been stalling? Sorry, I read that in a commentary and I just had to use that line. <laughs> Has he been calling, but you have been stalling? 
Just remember, when you hold back something and are not obedient to the Lord, it doesn't affect just you, right? It affects those around you. There is collateral damage. It affects those around you. Again, it could affect those even outside of your sphere of influence. God works through us, through our obedience to bless those around us. So are you ready to submit that area that you're holding back to the Lordship of Jesus? Whatever that area may be. Be open to the Spirit's promptings this morning. Let today be the day when you release whatever has been holding you back from living out the life that God is calling you to live, to change direction, to do whatever he has been calling you to do. Jonah was refusing God's call to call a people to repentance, to offer them good news of God's grace and mercy. I didn't go into this morning thinking this was going to be kind of a, a missionary sermon, right? Because we have a couple of people here had a couple of missionary moments. But the fact is, Elijah has accepted that call upon his life to go, to do what God is calling him to do. Aaron has accepted the call, the kingdom call to do work in Louisiana. They heard the call and they didn't say, Louisiana, it's hot down there. Belize is pretty cool. I, I, I guess that was pretty easy to go to. <laughs> no, they heard the call and they said, okay. All right, God, if that's what you're calling me to do, if that's what you're calling my family to do, then that's what we're going to do. So maybe God is calling someone in here today to turn maybe from your prayerless plans, things that you really haven't been pray, praying about, you've just kind of been doing just makes sense. Well, this is just what I'm going to do. So turn from your prayerless plans to the plans that he has for you. Because he may be calling someone in this room to rise and go to a people group that you don't like, that maybe even you're scared of, or maybe you have certain ideas about. But if you sense that call upon you this morning, if you're sensing God calling you specifically to that this morning, don't turn away. Don't run. Turn to him and open yourself up for what God has for you. And in turn, for those whose lives you will impact. Brothers and sisters, God loves us dearly. Each one of us, he desires to use in spectacularly different ways. But the fact is, he has placed the call on each one of us. There's a general call for us to manifest the love and grace of God to everyone that we come into contact with. There is this call to, to make known to those around us his goodness and his mercy, proclaiming the gospel. There's also a call to where he's calling people to go to different places as well. But there's all kind of calls, isn't there? It doesn't have to do just with missions. It could be something that God, you're putting off because you just know how difficult it's going to be. A conversation that you know you have to have and God's just placed it on your heart, but you're just not doing it because it's going to be difficult and it could affect this or that or whatever it may be. Anyway, I could run, after, run through scenario after scenario after scenario of how God may be calling each one of us to do different things. And I'm just saying, by the, God, by the power of God and His Spirit in you, take a step toward doing it. Have the courage to face reality. The more we do that, the more we're going to see God work. And the more reason we're going to have to worship and praise God. And to lift up that throne of praise that our God inhabits. Our praises. Because we see Him working.